Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, I welcome you to the webinar for uh, South African National Standard 21001, or like we call it, uh, 20001, uh, which was published in 2020. Uh, it is a quality management system for the educational um, organizations and a management system for it uh, with requirements and guidance of use. This management system um, will be introduced today to you by a team of experts and uh, we have got uh, in the room today uh, three esteemed speakers um, from in educational institutions and uh, but all from higher educational in institutions. Um, but first of all, we're going to introduce you to the SABS and I'm going to go through a quick round of introductions of our speakers uh, for the day. Um, the first one will be Dr. Sadvir Basun, and I asked Dr. Sadvir to put on his camera and uh, to just introduce himself, himself to you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Helian Temple. My name is Sadvir Basun, and uh, I'm the executive for the Standards Division. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and talk a bit about the SABS with specific reference on the role of the national standards body in developing South African national standards. Thank you. Thank you, Satvir. Uh, the next gentleman I would like to introduce is uh, Mr. David Stables. Uh, Mr. David Stables, if you can put on your camera. Uh, David is the chairperson of our technical committee 176 for quality management systems. David, if you can just give us a quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Helene, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as Helene said, my name is David Stables. I've been in the quality management field. I think we count it in decades now rather than years. And uh, I've also been in the higher education system for over 26 years. And uh, my heart is quite close to quality management systems, and particularly um, ISO 9001 and this one, 21001. Thank you, Helene. Thank you very much, David. Um, I, uh, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Prof. Uh, Roy Rampal uh, from UNISA. And uh, Prof. Roy, if you can put on your camera and introduce yourself, please. Just unmute for us, please. Good morning, everybody and welcome to the session. Uh, it's Roy, Roy Rampal here. I've had 20 years experience in industry. I was one of the pioneers of implementing ISO 9001 in 1987. And I have more than 25 years experience in academia, in quality, looking at quality of learning, as well as quality assurance and quality of research. So my present position in the SBL as a Quality Assurance and Enhancement Manager. I'm also the president of the Southern African Society for Quality, where we promote quality to standards. And we, I'm excited to be here so that we can also learn from 21001 and take it further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Prof. Roy. Um, I, um, our last speaker for the day, um, which will not only be a speaker, but will actually uh, um, look at what the other speakers have said and give us a comprehensive um, a, a, um, summary of the uh, uh, what has been said. Um, a moderated summary is Prof. Humphrey Mogashaw. And uh, hum, Prof. Humphrey, if you can please in, uh, put on your camera in, and introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Temple. I am Humphrey uh, Mogashaw. I am a professor at UNISA. I'm a director of academic quality assurance and enhancement in the office of the vice principal teaching and learning. I'm looking forward to this engagement and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the speaker, you can now uh, close your camera. Um, 
I'm, we're going to start uh, to keep uh, to time and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Sadvir Pisun to take us through an introduction to the SABS and the standards development process. And uh, I would like to just um, also say that um, uh, Prof. Uh, um, Rampal and uh, Prof. Uh, um, Dr. And Mr. Stables has been working with us for many years. And uh, so if you think we are all very familiar to each other, yes, we are. And uh, it's a team of us presenting this to you. Uh, Dr. Basun, please. Thank you, Helian. Um, so I trust uh, colleagues, you can hear me. Helian, just to confirm that. Yes, sir. Great, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to give you a, a, a brief overview of the South African Bureau of Standards um, and spe with specific reference to um, the national standards body uh, and the work that we do. So just going to try and move my slides, which appears at this stage to be stalling. OK, great, uh, that's much better. So the South African Bureau of Standards um, has basically been around for the past 75 years. Uh, this year we celebrate our 75th anniversary and to the month which uh, was September, where we um, you know, acknowledge um, our standardization activities for the past um, seven and a half decades, both at the international level, regional level, and more importantly, at the national level. So the SABS is basically legislated by mandate um, uh, according to the Standards Act um, and the recent act promulgated was of 2008. We fall within the directorate of for the government department of Department of Trade and Industry and Competition and fall within the directorate of the SQUAM directorate and the acronym thereof is Standards Quality Assurance Accreditation and Metrology. So basically the SABS is the national standards body of South Africa. Our key mandate is to develop, promote and maintain South African national standards. We are also responsible for promoting quality with respect to commodities, products, services uh, for the domestic and export markets. And we also provide conformity assessment services. And there are a wide range of conformity assessment services, which includes certification services, laboratory services, local content verification, inspection, training, etc. Now there are four other departments or four other entities that form part of the SQUAM technical infrastructure. The first being NRCS, the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications. Uh, as quite rightly points out, it is a regulator and it administers regulations to ensure compliance with specific uh, aspects of protection of health and safety and environmental protection. Then we have SANAST, which is the uh, national accreditation system. This body is responsible to officially make sure that bodies that provide certification services, testing services, etc., have the right competencies uh, and, and infrastructure in place. So they become accredited to provide these services. And lastly, but not least, NAMISA, which is the National Metrology Institute of South Africa, and they're responsible for calibration through measurement, accuracy, and measurement traceability. All these four entities are individually legislated to provide their core functions. They work very closely with each other to ensure the efficient functioning of the economy. So specifically in terms of the services of the SABS, our core mandate is to develop South African national standards. We are the only entity in South Africa that develops South African national standards and every um, national standards and every country has a national standards body. And therefore we have a very good collaborative relationship with the 165 national standards bodies who are members of the International Organization for Standardization, where we, where we, could, um, we could share best practice on standards and standard solutions as well. We also provide access of South African national standards and international standards. Just bear in mind, standards are not for free, they're copyright protected, um, and we need to adhere to the copyrights and protection thereof. I mentioned earlier, there's a wide diverse range of uh, laboratory services and testing services that the SABS offers. We are the local content verification authority in South Africa, mandated by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. 
We provide training services and these training services are specifically in our management system st standards, typically your ISO 9000, ISO 14000, ISO 45000, etc., which supports the certification business of the SABS. There's also an element of consignment inspection, whereby we go in and inspect consignment of goods um, and specifically the focus is, in, is uh, currently on government department procurement of consignments. We also provide certification, product and system certification, and these uh, portfolio of services fall within the commercial side of the SABS. So just to give you a brief snapshot of uh, the global objectives coming down to the national objectives and how we work. South Africa is a signatory of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and there's objectives and ambitions of projects and programs that need to be implemented from a South African perspective to achieve the goals 2030. Each government department has been allocated a project or two or a portfolio of programs that are aligned to achieving all 17 goals and address the goals to achieve these by uh, within the 10 year period. That's from a global perspective. From a national perspective, we have our national development plan and the national development plan is underpinned by nine pillars, key pillars that we want to address, which addresses two fundamental issues from a national perspective, addressing poverty and inequality. In addition to that, we are responsible for ensuring that we support the industrialization ambitions of the country. So the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition has identified the reinvigorated uh, industrial priority sectors, and this provides an indication of the various sectors that have been earmarked towards supporting local industrialization, including mining, agriculture and agro-processing, industrial sector, tourism, high-tech sectors, defense, aerospace, oceans economy, and the creative sector. So this provides an indication of the enormity of the tasks that the SAVS has to provide to support both the public and private sector in developing national solutions in the sense of South African national standards, which provide knowledge and solutions uh, to address these wide variety of projects and programs uh, aligned to national priorities. This is all done as part of our technical committee structures and the scopes of our technical committees, the technical committee strategic business plans, the leadership and influence at international level, leadership uh, as well as regional level, and more importantly, at national level, where a diverse range of stakeholders, experts in their own right, participate and contribute towards the technical solutions referred to as South African national standards. OK, so I'm trying to just move. OK, great. So we did a, a very brief mapping exercise between the National Development Plan, all nine pillars, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And you could see that there's a strong level of alignment between the National Development Plan. Quite you know, importantly, if you look at too few jobs as one of the National Development Plan pillars, what, how does this line up and stack up with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, it certainly looks at Development Goal 1, 2, or addresses Development Goal 1, 2, and 8. No poverty, zero hunger, decent work and economic growth. So all these pillars, as defined by the NDP, has a very good and close alignment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So if we have projects and programs uh, aligned to the NDP, certainly we will be addressing global perspective, perspectives as well. And there's one critical element as part of our NDP, which is poor education. And this is aligned to equal education, which is goal number four of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this is uh, certainly uh, the, the topic of discussion today. Uh, during this webinar, we will get some key insights on uh, the 21001 uh, South African National Standard as adopted from ISO. Just want to make some inference to the World Standards Day. So on the 14th of October, on an, and it's an annual event uh, whereby the World Standards, uh, international standards uh, bodies, including the national standards bodies, uh, celebrate uh, the World Standards Day. The theme for this year is protecting the planet with standards. And um, basically you'd see the poster, and this is the winning poster from the um, 
uh, Bureau of Indian Standards. Um, they have submitted and they have basically were awarded with the winning poster. But the three international organizations, ISO, IEC and ITU, these are instrumental in celebrating the, um, the, the aspects of World Standards Day, especially aligned to the theme and projecting the solutions and deliverables that they have delivered over the last couple of uh, decades in terms of addressing the issues of protecting the planet. Certainly from a national standards body perspective, we are very grateful to have the caliber of experts. And this is one of the fundamental objects of World Standards Day is to embrace the technical experts that participate on a voluntary basis at their own accord time and the amount of effort, dedication and commitment they put towards the development of South African national standards. And, uh, and we certainly salute the team that have been instrumental in developing standards for the past seven and a half decades uh, in providing technical solutions to national priorities. So a brief uh, review of the current um, scope of work of our technical committee, specifically aligned to this current uh, theme this year, which is protecting the planet with standards. If we have to look at the various UN SDGs that are aligned to this particular theme this year, you would see that SDG 6, 7, 13, 14, 15, 9, 12 and 11 are just a few of the examples that come in very closely to addressing um, uh, um, solutions around climate change and protecting the, the, uh, the planet. I've also included a snapshot of the various technical committees. SABS administers and, and provides the governing structure of more than 300 technical committees and subcommittees traversing a very wide and diverse range of topics and development of solutions around uh, the scopes of these technical committees. So as an example, if you have to look at um, the industry innovation and infrastructure goal nine, you'd see that we have a technical committee and various subcommittees around construction standards, structural and geotechnical design, if you'll have to look at other scopes, including affordable and clean energy, the solutions derived in technical committees include energy efficiency, electricity distribution, smart grids, alternative fuel vehicles, energy storage, intelligent transport systems, facilities management, smart communities. So it's a, it's pretty a diverse range of work that we do in our technical committees that provides these solutions. Uh, just lastly, just to highlight life on uh, land as an example, we talk about solutions within the scope of security and resilience. And I think we all know a lot about that uh, in the recent pandemic and the uh, and the solutions that had to be put in place specifically around management systems, including product specifications as well around PPE, etc. that we had to pivot and start working differently in our environment. And how do we work differently in a very changing and evolving ecosystem and standards needs to embrace that as well. So technical committees around carbon capture, transport, storage, con uh, nature conservation, energy management, air quality, a pretty uh, diverse range of solutions within these scopes that we provide to both the public and private sector. I also want to just highlight a few of the management system standards. So a lot of you would be aware of ISO 9000, um, SANS ISO 9001, SANS ISO 14001, and you would see the acronym SANS is the South African National Standard. Why we have SANS? Because as a member of ISO, we adopt these international standards and we are allocated a dual numbering, meaning that we have taken an international standard and now we've domesticated it to address national imperatives. Um, so you would see all our publications would be SANS, and if it's adopted from ISO or IEC, it will have a slab ISO or a slash IEC according to the nomenclature that ISO and IEC has. So there are a number of management system standards that are addressed and aligned to once again to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And over the recent past, we have had the opportunity to go out uh, and present and host a number of webinars uh, around these management system standards uh, and particular reference to the areas that we have seen quite a, a number of challenges, specifically in reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. As an example, we had a webinar on the occupational health and safety management system, um, the business continuity management system, SANS 22301. Uh, we had a very uh, you know, insightful uh, webinar 
on anti-bribery management system. This is a very common word, a bribery corruption that we see and hear of on a daily basis. And we have a management system uh, standard that has been published by ISO and adopted by um, South African Bureau of Standards as SANS 37001. And it's a management system aligned to the principles and concepts of 9001 can be put as an integrated structure uh, in various management systems that already implemented and uh, provides tools and solutions of how we could address anti-bribery um, within the context of, uh, of the ecosystem in South Africa. And lastly, uh, our hosting today of the Educational Organization Management System, which, uh, which is SANS 21001. I think uh, further to emphasize the importance of standards in the public sector, private sector and the consumer, standards basically reflects the state of art and serves as a vehicle for the dissemination of new technologies, innovative practices, facilitates trade, which is one of the very clear articulated roles of standards in terms of movement of goods and services between countries, uh, between regions, etc., and and the global movement of of these goods and services, and certainly in, uh, supports industrialization objectives as well. Our deliverables also support the technical aspects of societal and environmental policies and contribute to sustainable development. So this means that the policymakers, government departments, ministries, etc., as well as the regulators, have the opportunity to look at our standards, adopt our standards and reference our standards as part of their solutions to achieve a technical policy or regulatory objective. And this is very fundamental to our engagement with the public sector. It also offers a wide range of tools for the various conformity assessment services um, that we provide as the SABS and various other conformity assessment bodies that operate in the environment in South Africa as well. What it does is that it provides an enhanced confidence in products, systems, processes, and, and acknowledgement of personnel as well. From a consumer perspective, it certainly increases the way of uh, making informed uh, buying decisions by the consumer. The consumer has the opportunity to determine foot for purpose products and services and allows them the choice to determine which products they see that will meet their requirements. So quite simply, standards are knowledge and they are represent a, an agreed way of considering a current or potential issue. Uh, and the issue could be either a challenge in the marketplace or more importantly, an opportunity in the marketplace. It provides a wide variety of um, deliverables. It could be a requirement document, a specification, a guideline, a management system document like the 21001 we're discussing today and uh, basic or characteristics that allows for consistent uh, ensuring that materials, products and processes are fit for purpose. I would also like to emphasize that standards that published by the South African Bureau of Standards as South African national standards are for voluntary application. This is very important to understand and we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the, the uh, little more detail in the slide for, to follow. We are members of ISO and IEC and we certainly develop our, internet, our standards aligned to international best practice. So standards are not um, regulations, uh, meaning the outputs delivered by the SABS. We ensure that regulatory authorities um, work as closely as possible with the SABS in our technical committees, uh, whereby they could use our standards uh, uh, and reference our standards as part of their solutions. Regulatory authorities should endeavor to apply and reference our standards that respect the voluntary nature. So the SABS does not have a regulatory mandate and quite rightly so as well. We are developing solutions for a self-regulatory mechanism in the marketplace. Uh, regulations and the, the uh, implementation and the enforcement of regulations comes with a particular uh, solution that needs to be met in the marketplace, either market failure of the use of particular requirements or standards, or it has a safety and health uh, concern that needs to be addressed or environmental concern that needs to be addressed in the marketplace. Uh, and uh, we, we constantly track the, the number of standards uh, that are referenced in the national and local legislation. And to date, we have in excess of 1,100 South African national standards that are referenced in national and local regulations that serve to meet the objects of the policy and regulatory uh, 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 stakeholders. 
just to provide you with an overview of the of the uh, principles that we need to abide by. So I mentioned we're members of ISO and IEC, and uh, we need to develop standards in an open, transparent, make sure and transparent principle, make sure that our standards are market relevant. It has to go through due process, coherence, consensus is key to what we do, which is general agreement within the committee members themselves, and we try as far as possible to make sure we have an extensive stakeholder engagement. Stakeholder balance is, is something that's not very easily achieved because the majority of the stakeholders in our technical committees are may, mainly industry representatives because they are the major uptake uh, and users of our South African national standards. However, there's a fair share of representation of government departments, labor, academia. Academia certainly do play a very important role as individual experts participating uh, in our technical committees. Uh, there's an element of small, medium and micro enterprises, enterprises participating as well, um, and to a lesser extent, NGOs and, and consumer bodies as well. So we try as far as possible to encourage uh, these various stakeholder groupings to participate in our technical committees uh, and develop national standards so that the process could be as inclusive as possible. So the engine of the development of national standards is the experts, as I pointed out earlier. SABS provides the governance and the administration of the process and the rules and procedures of how to develop national standards, but the experts uh, from the various stakeholder groups are responsible for the technical input that needs to go to uh, in the, the national standards. So as members of ISO and IEC, um, SABS, um, as uh, working very closely with the experts and participating in these international forums, have the opportunity to influence, firstly, the international standards, to develop these international standards, and secondly, has the opportunity to adopt these international standards. Uh, we try as far as possible to adopt them identically, uh, but where there are opportunities and peculiarities in terms of climatic changes, technological uh, disadvantages or changes, um, as well as geographical differences, uh, we have the opportunity to change the standards and adopt them accordingly uh, as uh, modified adoptions. At a regional level, this is a very important role that is going to be evolving very closely with the support of the African Continental Free Trade Area. As you very well aware, the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area has, has kick-started and uh, the various signatories, all 55 member countries, have a responsibility to ensure that programs, projects are driven to allow for the ease and of, of movements of goods and services between the 54 member countries in the continent. There are a number of regional standards bodies, but two key ones in the uh, that are ultimately responsible for the development and harmonization of standards within the 54 member countries is ARSO, the African Organization for Standardization, and AFSEC, which is the African Electrotechnical Standardization Commission. SABS participates uh, quite rigorously in all of these technical committees of these regional standards bodies to develop regional uh, harmonized texts and, and documents and this will allow for um, uh, the support of the continental free trade area. We are also members of the BRICS standardization forum, the Pacific Area Standards Congress and the Commonwealth Standards Network which is a multilateral uh, stakeholder engagement on sharing of best practice, not necessarily developing standards for the regions but sharing of best practice and should supporting each other in terms of driving uh, specific agendas at ISO and IEC. At a national level, we have publication or a catalog of more than 7,500 standards. Annually, we publish uh, about 250 standards. Uh, committees, uh, we have more than 300 committees and the expertise in excess of 1,700 experts participating in our technical committees. Do not want to go into detail around the development process, but just to highlight that there are six development processes in aligned to international best practice that we are in, that we engage with, and it's a step by step process for the development of international standards to ensure that we abide by those various principles as highlighted in the previous slides. And there's an, an, a significant element of consensus and inclusivity. The first step is when there's a preliminary, it refers to as a PWI, preliminary uh, item, whereby a request could come from a technical committee 
an expert or an individual uh, or a citizen uh, submits this uh, proposal. This proposal is subsequently evaluated within the technical committee. And if it's endorsed by the technical committee based on the relevance of this proposal, uh, it is approved by the approvals committee and subsequently goes into a preparation stage, which, which includes a working draft. And, and this is a working group of technical experts that develop the technical content. It then goes to a round of committee stages, which is the technical committee or the subcommittee, depending on the scope of the committees uh, on to develop consensus. And uh, finally, once consensus is reached within the technical committee, it goes out on the public inquiry process. And this is very important to appreciate is that this every document that goes out as a public inquiry means that every single citizen has the opportunity to comment on that draft South African standard, which is referred to as DSS. And we take those comments. It's, it's out for a period of 60 days uh, and it's a legal requirement. It's uh, further gazetted as well. And we take those um, comments and it's those comments are addressed by the technical committee, secretary and the chair. And uh, once those comments have been addressed adequately uh, and is due for publication, the document is subsequently published and that's basically a brief overview of the process of developing national standards. We also have been very uh, st strongly engaged around education about standardization and we feel that the amount of work that is in uh, especially we've been focusing on the tertiary institutions that focuses on, on standardization is is minimal and can be matured and strengthened because I think there are a few modules or courses disparately engaged with various other courses or degrees that relate to something about trade trade agreements. But fundamentally, how do standards provide a uh, uh, the benefits and how do standards uh, play a significant role in trade and trade agreements? Uh, I think that's very poorly articulated or not even articulated and transmitted to the um, tertiary institutions. Secondly, how do standards support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, and that is key to the global agenda. And how do we take that as part of a modular course, et cetera, or discussion point in tertiary institutions? How do standards support the government and regulatory um, regimes uh, or ecosystem and play a very important role in effective governance in various economies? And lastly, the economic economic benefits of standards. There have been several cases, even published by the SABS, on the microeconomic benefits of standards uh, at at a company level, and how does can this be taught or introduced um, as as a course or a module at tertiary institutions? So we've been engaging quite rigorously over the last couple of months to reinvigorate our engagement around education about standardization. And there's a guideline on teaching standards, which as we engage with the, with institutions, we provide these guidelines. And um, specific to this is uh, our publication, recent publication of 2020, which is Educational Organizations Management System for Educational Organization Requirements with Guidance for Use, which is the ISO 21001, recently adopted as a South African national standard. And this uh, standard addresses at least three key um, elements within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we will continue quite rigorously to engage with tertiary institutions. I must say that UNISA SBL has, we've been engaging with them for a number of years. We've concretized our, our establishment and an agreement uh, to the effect that UNISA has a management development program specifically around standards uh, and standardization issues. And uh, we, we try and, and take that and emulate that in other institutions as well. And I think that's basically where I'll end my presentation. Thank you, um, 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 Helene, and uh, I trust we'll take questions and comments later in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satvir. I think you gave us a very, very uh, good overview of the standards development process, why we are there, and why we actually take uh, part in the, develop, uh, the development of international standards. Um, I would like to now move over to the real crux of the, why are we here today. We are here today to look at uh, the SANS 21001 Educational Organization Standard, a quality management system that is developed specifically for 
uh, educational institutions, whether it is a tertiary level or at higher educational level, um, it is there to make sure that the customers, and who are the customers, the learners, the beneficiaries, the, the Department of Education, um, those are the people. David is going to tell us all about that today. And uh, I'm going to introduce David now. David uh, has been, as he said, more than 26 years in higher education already. David has done his master's degree, um, uh, degree in uh, the development of a quality management system for educational institutions. So what was first? Was it first da David's master's thesis or was it first the start of the development of SANS 21001? Um, David will have to tell us that and he will uh, he's going to tell uh, take us through the process now and I, uh, the, I, I ask David now to uh, start his video, please. David? Okay, thank you very much, Aline. Uh, first of all, can I have confirmation that so you can see my presentation. Can everybody it, see this? It is it is coming, uh, but I don't see it yet. Uh, maybe still loading. Somebody, it's loading. It's loading. Thank you, Bjorn. There's a slight delay. Our apologies for that. Oh. Looks like this presentation doesn't load as quick as okay. we want. Okay, so while while David's um, presentation is loading, I can always also tell the audience that David has already written two textbooks that are used in higher education. Uh, these are both based for uh, for uh, manage, uh, management with quality management and. Uh, He's very passionate about about the subject, and his students, as as uh, um, also indicated to us, uh, that they feel that David is very very passionate and convey the message of quality management, not only in the nine thousand, fourteen thousand, as fifty thousand, but also now the twenty one thousand to them with great pa passion. Um, Maybe, uh, Mahabu, can I ask that you load the presentation for David, please? Okay, David is, David is coming on now. David, we we can see your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. And once again, good morning, everybody who's joined this webinar. Uh, as you see, it's uh, SANS 21001-2020. Well, the origin of this standard goes back many, many years. In fact, it first started off as an international workshop agreement, which was like a sort of fast-tracking the development of an ISO standard. That probably goes back about 12 years or so. And it was really promoted by countries such as Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, particularly those South American and Central American countries. ISO does not like the proliferation of standards. So for a standard like this one to be developed, there must have been very, very strong motivation. And there was strong motivation to have this developed. There's very few um, standards that are spin-offs from the ISO 9001 standard. There's one in the automotive field, there's one in the aeronautical field, there's one in the petrochemical field, but there are very few because of the string, stringent regulations that ISO has for them. And I'm very glad it went from international workshop agreement until an ISO standard, so everybody um, can benefit from this. And just as we heard just now, is not only for universities, TVET colleges, schools, high schools, primary schools, but also for training departments within organizations whose prime focus is to develop the competencies of the workforce and the staff in their organizations. So looking at the relevance, 
in the second slide, is a, there is a critical and continuous need for educational organizations to evaluate the degree to which they meet the requirements of learners and other beneficiaries. And when we talk about requirements of beneficiaries and learners, I remember it was quite a few years ago, it was the University of Wolverhampton, and they implemented ISO 9001, but before they could, they had to have a debate, who were the beneficiaries? Who actually were their customers? And actually it took them six months to work it out, because it's not just the students, the learners, but it's also, what about the future employers? employers? What about society at large? What about the people, the parents of those students? So there are many different beneficiaries from the education system. It's not just the person who's sitting in class and learning. And also it builds on the success of 9001. And if you're not familiar with ISO 9001, I'm pretty sure you are, it is the most popular of all the ISO management standards, of which there are 53. And there's something like over one and a half million organizations worldwide that have not only implemented, but got certified by a third party certification body as meeting the requirements. It's also estimated about another one and a half million organizations that have implemented it just for the point of having a good system in place. And they never went the certification route. And it was some years ago when I had the CFO of the Nelson Mandela's Children's Fund attend one of my courses on how to implement ISO 9001. And he wasn't there because he wanted the um, Nelson Mandela's Children's Fund to be certified to 9001. He just wanted a good management system. Nothing more, nothing less. And his research showed him that these quality management system standards are simply a good management system standard. And it's there to benefit an organization. So 21,001, Specified requirements for the management system for educational organizations when such an organization needs to demonstrate its ability to support the acquisition and development of competence through teaching, learning, or research. I think this is what uh, Prof. Rampel said just now about uh, in his background and what UNISA is doing is uh, promoting that uh, excellence. Also, it's aims to enhance satisfaction of learners and other beneficiaries, as well as the staff. In fact, in one of the uh, clauses in the standard, they talk about the psychosocial aspects of the learning environment. Um, Anti-bullying, as an example, which is very particular for uh, school children. So we are engaging in those type of aspects as well within the standard and within the management system. But all the requirements are generic. And if I compare the ISO 9001 standard, which is quite generic, um, it's not just for manufacturing or engineering companies, service organizations. In fact, my own company has been certified to ISO 9001 for many, many years. Um, but it is very generic. But now about 30% more in 21,001 has been added to focus and shift the focus to these educational institutions. So they're tended to be applicable to any organization that uses a curriculum to support the development of competence through teaching, learning, or research, regardless of the type, size, or methods of delivery. Also, uh, it can be applied to educational organizations within larger organizations. Um, these are training departments within companies. Uh, you don't have, the whole organization doesn't have to go and implement 21,001. It could be just one section of that organization that deals with training and development. The document does not apply to organizations that only produce or manufacture educational products. In other words, there must be an interaction with the learner, with the development of competency and in fact, the term competency is also defined in the standard. But it's essentially, it's knowledge and skills, but most important, the ability to apply those knowledge and skills that are acquired. So looking at uh, interested parties, who are the interested parties? And I say, it's not just the student itself or the learner itself. There are many interested parties. So this is the typology of interested parties. Of course, primarily, 
we first have the learners, which means we have the students. And they will be our primary interested party and also being apprentices as well. So it goes right across the board. Secondly, other beneficiaries would be the government. Well, we want uh, successful people to get employment. If people are employed, they pay taxes and the government is happy. If they're not employed, no taxes are being paid and the government is not happy, I think, as they are today. Uh, it's the labor market for fruitful employment. Uh, we want people who can actually function within, actively and positively within the labor market. And of course, parents and guardians, because often they invest a lot of time, money, effort in developing their children over time through primary, secondary, hopefully tertiary education. And they like to see the benefit of that. They like to see their children to be successful. Staff, the well, staff of these institutions are very important. So we talk about the employees, and it's not just the lecturer, facilitators, but administration departments, etc., and volunteers as well. Often there are many volunteers that, that help with the development of um, people learning and acquiring knowledge and skills. And then we have various other interested parties as well. And this would be educational organizations, uh, such as the Department of Education, uh, South African Qualifications Authority, SACWA, uh, organizations like that, media and society. Uh, they are very interested in how educational organizations are functioning, being successful. External providers that provide uh, knowledge, materials, um, facilities to educational organizations, uh, shareholders. Uh, we're seeing more and more the privatization of various uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary organizations, um, private schools, private universities, and these have shareholders. Uh, commercial partners, because um, as the students graduate, they often go into industry and commerce. We hope they go into industry and commerce. And we want a well-rounded product coming out of the universities that meet those commercial partners' requirements. And then alumni, often who, people who have studied and been successful at the organization, uh, typically university, become part of the alumni, and often support those institutions uh, further along the line. So there are many interested parties here. It's not just the first one which is the students and the students alone. Look at the potential benefits of this standard. First of all, it's a better alignment of objectives and activities with policy, including mission and vision. And one of the requirements is to have a policy uh, for the organization, and a policy is an intention. And, most, and many times these quality policies uh, do include the mission and the vision for that organization because it's part and parcel of the way we do business. Also enhance social responsibility by providing inclusive and equitable quality education for all. More personalized learning and effective responses, response to all learners, and particularly to learners with special education needs, distance learners, and lifelong, uh, lifelong learning opportunities. And I was reading in yesterday's paper about uh, how more and more people, because of the pandemic, have become distance learners. And they're not looking forward to going back to school and uh, or back to university. In fact, in many instances, they do very well if they have the discipline to work from home. And their marks have shown a significant increase. And consistent processes and evaluation tools to demonstrate and increase effectiveness and efficiency. Increase credibility of the organization. We read in the uh, news media about these or fly-by-night colleges or schools. Um, then where's the credibility? How do they actually attract customers? And how do they get away with it as well? Also, it means that it enables educational organizations to demonstrate their commitment to effective educational management practices. What better indication than an educational organization being a university or even a faculty at a university or even a department for that matter, or at a TVET college, 
or at a school, primary or um, secondary, that um, shows their commitment to the educational management by adopting ISO 21001 and using its guidelines as well as its requirements to prove that they are committed. And then a culture for organizational improvement, harmonization of regional, national, open priority, so propriety and other standards within the international framework. So again, aligning with uh, other organizations worldwide and partnering perhaps with uh, different universities or other institutions, widen participation of interested parties and even the stimulation of excellence and innovation. And uh, one can say, well, be innovative, but it's not that easy. It needs to be stimulated. You can't demand people to be innovative. The standard is based on a number of principles. And the first one is to focus on learners and those other beneficiaries we uh, talked about and discussed. The second principle is to have visionary leadership. Engagement of people, which would be parents, um, customers, industry, commerce, as well as the students, staff members. Process approach. Well, there's nothing new about the process approach. In fact, almost 40 years ago, one of the Koji gurus in America, his name was Fidel Crosby, made the statement in 1981 that all work is a process and by no other way. And it is very true. When we started writing the 9001 standard, the current 9001 standard, uh, that was in um, 2012, and we started in St. Petersburg. That's the first thing the international community told us. We have to look at the process approach right throughout the whole standard. Course improvement is always ongoing. Evidence-based decisions. Uh, too many decisions are based on thumbs up, or in my experience, and things are constantly changing. So we need evidence. Relationship management, relationship of staff with the students, with the learners, relationship of staff between themselves, and with uh, higher organizations. Social responsibility, accessibility and equity, ethical conduct and education, and even data security and protection. And we do have such as the Poppy Act, which uh, helps us on that. So let's have a quick look at what does the standard look like? And I've got a, what I call a helicopter view of the standard. And it does follow uh, the late Dr. Deming's PDCA, which he established some 60 years ago. And that's what plan, do, check, act, cycle. And if we look at the first clauses of under plan, and this is in the green, context of the organization. What challenges do we have? What's the scope of our system? What is the management system for the educational organizations? Leadership and leadership and commitment. And there, I remember with the 9001, I was on the committee that wrote courses four and five, uh, we debated uh, quite vigorously about the word accountability, because who's accountable for the effectiveness of this management system? And that's top management, it is their system. We have a policy and then who's to do what, where, when, uh, under organizational roles. Planning, actions to address risks, and opportunities. There's risks in everything we do. And the second we open our eyes in the morning until the time we get to work and throughout the whole day, we're, we all have risks. And then our educational organization objectives, which essentially are business objectives related to what we're doing. And how do we establish them and how do we achieve them? And then planning and changes. And then under resources, as I said, even the um, psychosocial aspects and resources, the infrastructure, the environment in which we work, uh, competence, do we have competent people? And how do we define that competence? As I said, knowledge, skills, ability to apply. Awareness, is everybody aware of the system? Communication, and also what documentation do we need? We certainly don't want to over-document, but we don't want to under-document our, our system. And there's a new guideline coming next year on that, which is ISO 10013. Then we get to doing the job from planning and control right through to uh, 
actually doing the job, which is in clause 8.5 there, and then making sure our students, our learners go out with the right knowledge, skills, competencies. And if something does go wrong, how do we control that? And uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's linked to something we find under ACT. Performance evaluation, well, at what stages do we want to measure, analyze, and evaluate whether we're doing the right things in the right way and getting the right outputs or outcomes from that? And we carry out internal audits. The old saying, what gets measured gets done. Uh, that's why these, any of these management systems work, is because we carried out internal audits as to seeing how effective our systems are working and how can we improve. And then management review, where management needs to review because top management is accountable for the management system. And then act, how can we do better next time? So linked from 8.7, we have 10.1, which is non-conformity and corrective action. And corrective action being finding the root cause of the problem to make sure it never happens again. And then our ongoing continual improvement. And then we always look for opportunities for improvement. And again, that could include um, innovation. Also, right at the back of the um, standard, we have an anxia. And these anxias uh, give us further guidance, such as additional requirements for early childhood education, uh, principles for the economic, so for the environmental organization management system. The ones that I've given you just now, but there they um, talk about it, exactly what is the principle and how to apply that principle and the intent of that principle. Also classification of interested parties in educational organizations, such as the diagram I just showed you. Uh, guidelines for communication with interested parties, processes, measures, tools in educational organizations, example of mapping to regional standards, and then health and safety consideration for educational organizations, which I think with the pandemic, uh, <laughs> That must be quite a hot spot uh, that schools are struggling with at the moment. So that's giving you a broad overview of what this standard is about. Of course, there's a lot more detail in them. But if we just see it as simply a good management sy system and nothing more and nothing less, and that is beneficial, it's not as punishment sent by somebody, but it's a benevolent system. And it does have a positive effect on the bottom line. Yes, universities, colleges, schools are not there to make money. But however, if you're more efficient, you can do more with what you save and expand and give a better quality service because you're far more efficient. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward later in the webinar for any questions. Over to you, Helene. Thank you very, very much, uh, David. Uh, th this has really been insightful, and I think many people have learned uh, that that continuous circle is never finished until you've done the evaluation at the end of the day, because otherwise it will not, you will only do the implementation of what you've done and never move forward because what if once you've implemented you must reevaluate and actually see is it going to need further intervention um very important and and i believe suitably ca ca catered for in um, educational institutions uh, thank you then for david our chairperson from our uh, south african bureau of standards tc 176 uh, I, I now have the privilege to introduce one of the users of the standards, but also one of our committee members, uh, Prof. Roy uh, Rampal, um, that is going to, to give us the benefits of the SANS 21001 uh, for organizational in, um, institutions. Prof. Roy Rampal is a professor at UNISA, is at the Business School of Leadership. Uh, Prof. Roy has conducted re research on quality and has done many papers and uh, publications on uh, quality uh, uh, and uh, accreditation and he's a seasoned speaker and attendee of uh, various 
on various platforms and he is also a member of the Institute of Directors and then further of is a member of SACWA, he is a member of SATCA, he's been the chairperson of the uh, um, and the national pre president of SASC SASQ, the Southern African Society of Quality, uh, over the past uh, five years. So certainly is a steam person to have in our presence today. I hand over to you now, Prof. Roy. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, I just want to confirm you can see the slides. We can see the slides. You can start. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, all, and welcome once again. And I'm going to just give you a little bit more uh, regarding the, the benefits and what uh, what the system can do for you. And I also thank David for, for laying the foundation to, to this presentation. OK, the first thing is about ISO 9000. When you speak normally to an academic, they actually associate ISO 9000 with manufacturing even up to today. And that is because it normally standards give you a kind of, of a perception and gives you a kind of a philosophy. And, and I'm just running through the different versions here. 1987 was the first edition of ISO 9001, and this was suited very well suited for manufacturing. So that's where it all started that this is a manufacturing standard. In 1994, the second edition went to emphasize a little bit more on quality assurance. And in 2000, they went very strong on process management, something that David had alluded to just now. And also to try and get alignment with service organizations. In 1987 and 1994 standards were not appropriate for service organizations. In 2008, they provided more clarity of the clauses, hoping that service organizations could adopt this uh, as well, having more clarity. But the big breakthrough came in 20, the 2015 standard where it went on to a different mode altogether. Uh, it went on to risk-based thinking and took a very strong focus on plan, do, check, act, cycle. And also at the same time, they structured this on what we call a high-level structure. Now the high-level structure has 10 clauses, which is aligned with most standards. So, harmonizing of standards could be promoted on a high level structure. Recently, and as much as what David alluded to that went many, many years ago, they looked at language because one of the issues with a ISO standard and language at the university or language in the academic world or the teaching and world, learning world is very, very different. Even when it comes to understanding what is accreditation and certification, they mean different things in different kind of these sectors. So they looked at language, uh, they looked at students and beneficiaries. You know, they, in terms of customer focus, the biggest challenge at universities or educational institutions was defining who was the real customer. And because of that, that was one of the reasons where the ISO 9000 was not popular was because the customer focus really, or the customer definition was problematic. They added in social responsibility, health and safety, curriculum design and controls, assessment design and information and communication management. So they added all this over and above the 9001, which is the 2015 9001, and they created this 21001, which is not just a quality management system. Actually, it's a system that manages an organization. It's called a management systems for educational organizations. So we need to clarify that it's not the ISO 9001 that looks at quality standard, but this is a management standard. Now, this thing works across any kinds of educational institutes. It works on a multi context in terms of preschools, primary, secondary schools, high school, colleges, training centers, you name it. It looks at formal it, teaching, informal teaching, private schools, public schools. And basically, this standard is 
comes into play where there's learners, there's an institution involved, there's a curriculum, and there's beneficiaries. End of the day, if you have those four components, then ISO 20, well, I should say now SANS 21001 will suit the purpose. The philosophy then becomes looking at learners, labor market, government in terms of requirements and seeing to what extent institutions are satisfying learners, government, and labor markets. Now, we need to just take a, a view on what our challenges are in the education sector. First of all, we, we have increasing expectations. We all know about fees must fall. We all know about universities have to give better accountability. And remember, universities talk more about accountability than responsibility. And also, we have the case where funding is, is dropping. Uh, it's difficult to find money to study. And also, on the same side, people and students study and graduate, cannot find job opportunities, etc. So there's a huge cry and expectations, and just not from students. It's about us as professors. It's about lecturers. It's about examiners. It's about even the deans at school etc. So no matter where you are in the in the supply chain, as long as you're in education, there's increasing expectations. There's also a very strong voice now from students and you need to become more and more student focused, especially when we talk about inclusivity, diversity, engagement. In fact, the CAG is talking about but how we bring in the voice of the students into the governance of universities or institutions. Parents, student retention is another focus area, alumni, and, and most of all, we need to look at enhancing student experience. That's the first thing that we need to do is enhance student experience because if it's not getting a, a good experience, it doesn't mean it's going to be a successful student. Competence and retention of education, educators is another challenge. Uh, you know, many, many, if you look at the Sunday's paper, you'll see many universities apply, uh, advertising for academics, for teachers, for reviewers, examiners. There's always a short supply of that. And institutions need to know how do we improve competency of them, how you retain them, and how you keep them as long as possible in the system so that they can provide services to, for lifelong learning. Legislation and policies we all know is changing all the time. In fact, our education systems have legislation and policies changing all the time, so we're always in a flux of change. Quality of education is always a call for that from governments, from from universities, from controlling bodies, from SACWA. All these bodies are always calling about how are you improving education? Also looking at saying, how do we reduce costs? How do we look at financial viability? How do we make the quality of education so good? So when somebody leaves an institution with a, with a qualification that they can automatically slot into a job. Standardization of practices, uh, you know, education is one of those areas where even at the university, there's good practices, bad practices, and all over an institution, and that needs to be captivated into what we call a standardized set of practices. Provision of resources is another area that, that is a big challenge for universities, especially in the ICT space. Uh, for example, now with the COVID pandemic, how many institutions have actually went into themselves in a panic mode to get themselves organized with ICT? Uh, there's venues, there's pastoral care, something that we always forget is what is the pastoral care to the student? What is the pastoral care of a learner? How do we take care of emergencies? And those things are normally left out, and, and those are challenges. Managing changes in technology. As you know, technology is changing every day, by the minute, all the time. 
a new technology today becomes an old technology tomorrow. So how do we adapt for these things? For the industrial revolution, the, the whole academic area or sector, the whole education sector is talking about top industrial revolution. How do we get there? Data integrity is another big issue. How do we retain data? How do we capture data? And we'll talk a little bit more about that, about its importance. A lot of institutions are talking about smart campus. This seems to be a big challenge in terms of understanding a smart campus and, and how do we get there? What is the issues and how, what processes, what policies, etc. we use to get there? Now, if we implemented these outcomes and these are just projected benefits for us, student engagement. Student engagement is becoming a very big issue and I just spoke just now is about having the voice of the student, not only in the classroom, but in the management of an education institution. Better alignment of objectives and activities with policies with the way the standard rose itself in terms of monitoring, in terms of evaluation, in terms of assessment, in terms of improvement. One will see at the end of the day this consistent view of objectives and making sure that it is aligned with policy. Social responsibility is also taken into the standard, especially making it inclusive and equitable for quality education also promoting innovation, creation and co-creation of knowledge. That's another agenda we need to look at it, is creation and co-creation of knowledge. Lecturers are no more the best person to lecture anymore because sometimes the student knows more than the lecturer. So we have to change our modus operandi and, and capture the, the new knowledge that's coming from students. Consistent processes and evaluation tools. The standard has quite a lot of them in terms of assessment tools, what, how to do an assessment tool, how to put a curriculum together. So the, the standard dictates that. Increased accountability and credibility of the educational organization. This gives you, because it's an international standard, because it's, it's supposed to be also known nationally, and it's supposed to be on par with, in terms of its certification with peer organizations, one will expect that there's going to be a lot of accountability and credibility of the, of the organization just by getting the label of SANS 21001. Culture. Culture of the organization will change. Harmonization of all the standards that are floating around can be brought into the standard. The one slide that Dr. Bishun had shared where there was a lot of standards that are now captivated the same standard. It's all, each one of the standards can be brought in here some way. The main thing is also it gives us academics to start thinking about systems, start thinking about processes, start thinking about how we innovate, how we go into excellence, how we are effective and how effective is the organization to the learner. And above all is to be compliant and also with a high degree of accountability. This is very, very exploratory. I don't know if colleagues in the higher education will know that the Council of Higher Education is looking at the new quality assurance framework, which is the QAF, uh, been sent around already for comment. And we just took a little snapshot and did an exploratory analysis of that uh, QAF with the SANS 21001. And these were context of organization in terms of the uh, standard meets what the QAF is saying about university context. The leadership aspect reflects on, again, on institutional responsibility, accountability, quality promotion, stakeholders, stakeholder focus. So all these things are in the 
new framework. Planning, again, a thing like enrollment planning is part of the QAF. Again, it, it falls under planning in 21,001. Student support is a big area in the QAF, and again, that is covered in the 21,001. Operation, quality promotion, teaching and learning, research and community engagement processes, information management in the QAF is articulated under operation in the standard. We talk about internal quality assurance, external quality assurance, review cycle monitoring and evaluation. It's again partners with performance evaluation in 21001. Quality enhancement, quality improvement, benchmarking, quality improvement plans. Again, it's a part, part of improvement in 21,001. Now, what we are saying here is there are a lot of the parts of the QAF, the new CHE QAF, that can be aligned with 21,001. So if an organization is implementing 20, 21,001. It's actually also in a way covering many of the requirements in the QAF. Again, what, what the 21,001 will promote and as required in the QAF is about national standards. It's about codes of practice and standards and guidelines. Universities will need to develop codes of practice and standards and guidelines across the faculties, in the faculties, across universities. And this can be promoted with national standards. And the opportunity is with, with that academia can start creating its own standards with the kind of structures that the South African Bureau of Standards has. So that's an opportunity there. External quality assurance, again, that what, what is required by the QAF and that can be adopted or reviewed looking at a certification of 21,001. They require a quality management system. The, the foundation on which the 21,001 will operate will be some kind of a quality system. The other requirement of the QAF, he says, Higher educational institutes should take ownership of the quality development, assurance, improvement, and quality enhancement. Now that is a big change in the, in the modus operandi of the CHE because they want to hand over ownership of quality to the universities and they need to take what partly they have been doing and this is can be adopted and seen from an external agency as a certification of ISO 21001. So there is opportunities, and these are very, very exploratory, as I said, and one will need to go deeper into these things as we proceed. Now, we mustn't also forget about our road to excellence and where ISO or where the 21001 standard puts in. My recommendation and the way I view it, that the 21,001 should be the foundation of an institution on which good management practices and quality practices operate. These also supports other accreditations. Many uh, institutions have other kinds of accreditations that can be brought in and can be adopted much easily if they have the systems running on 21,001 because most of the things uh, or the areas that are required for accreditation are covered by the 21,001. And then even when you proceed further after getting your other accreditations in terms of work for excellence, all the knowledge and the foundations developed in 21,001 will match to what is required for excellence. Now, the challenges and opportunities we have going forward is basically, I won't say challenges, but as well as opportunities, 
is we need to develop a working group, including academics with SAPS as the certified certification or certified body. Uh, review auditing procedures to include peer review procedures. This is one of the things that uh, you know you institutions or educational institutions, uh, especially the, the, the universities, uh, sometimes do not like the word audit. Uh, so we need to have some kind of a system and we're going to use David's knowledge on the 19011 to develop some kind of peer reviewing mechanisms into the, the standards and into the, that profession. And it's a big opportunity for academics to start engaging, and publishing and teaching and uh, in this area of this new standard. I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Bissoon and his team at SABS for taking interest in this standard and also to make me feel part of it and also to, to actually uh, now see movement in the standard. We, we've been having a lot of talk around it for the past six, seven months, but now I can see it really taking shape and we are going to create momentum. Uh, Mr. David Staples, the director of TQIMS, thank you very much. And I think his involvement is crucial from both the academic side as well as his involvement in developing standards. Uh, other colleagues that are involved in terms of our, what we call our advisory group is Prof. Makashwa, who's the Director of Quality Assurance and Enhancement at UNISA, and Dr. Ronald, Randall Janis, who is the, the, uh, the NMMU Business School Director, but as well as he is the Chairman of the South African Business Schools Association that looks after the MBA programs for this country. With that, I just want to ask Ms. Helene if I can present a short video of five minutes or are we out of time? May I ask you, Helene? Um, thank you very much, Prof. Roy. Uh, we are actually running a bit as, uh, late, but uh, I think uh, the members of the audience will benefit from this uh, short video, so you may proceed. I just want to check with you, Helene, is the sound the coming Roy, through? It's, it, it, it's not coming through. We are not seeing the video yet. Um, I'm going to start with the introduction uh, of... Okay. Um, okay, it's coming. It's coming. There we go. We don't hear the sound. We don't hear That's the sound. I think I'll have to skip this. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, you can skip yeah. that and then we can run it after the uh, after the summary. Thank you yes. very much. Okay. Okay. I, I would just like to uh, thank um, Prof. Royden for his giving us the benefits and, he's only, and he only highlighted the benefits to us. Remember, for every institution, there could be more benefits. And uh, especially if you now look at uh, the, the uh, from the eyes of a Tivit College or a tertiary institution, you might actually find other benefits for yourselves. So uh, we thank you, uh, Prof. Roy, and I'm going to do, with any further ado, move to the moderated summary. And I'm going to ask Prof. Uh, Humphrey Mogushaw to actually um, do this for us. And uh, he's an associate professor from UNISA. He has been with, the, uh, uh, through, with uh, an academic for more than 25 years. And he has taught at the University of KZN as well as uh, uh, UNISA. We, 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 he joined uh, in, in 2000, 
Um, and from 2010 to 2015, he has been the head of the quality assurance in the College of Human Science. And since last year, uh, year 2019, he's been the director of acad academic quality assurance and enhancement uh, in the office of the vice president teaching and learning, community engagement and student support. Um, uh, Prof Humphrey, can I please ask that you do a moderated summary for us? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Staples, for the for the Ms. Temples for the um, uh, introduction and also for this opportunity to participate in this uh, seminar. Much appreciated. In doing my short summary here, I'm going to highlight a few things. I would like to start uh, first by just indicating that the theme and the focus of the program was very clear and it helped one to really know where we are heading to uh, in terms of also having a bigger picture where we are heading as a country in terms of national standards. I would like to start first by commenting and appreciating Dr. Bassoon. Um, I realized that I will let me just highlight just few pointers he mentioned and um, uh, and one aspect that I think I found missing in his uh, presentation, although I'm not supposed to uh, uh, comment on his, but on the other two speakers. Uh, firstly, I found the background about the role of the SABS very, very informative. Secondly, uh, I found that the 300, the over 300 technical subcommittees that the SABS is working with is an impressive work and we is highly commendable. And then thirdly, uh, also, the, that standards are not regulations. I found that a very important point. And then, um, fourthly, the issue of the role of experts uh, to contribute in the standards. I found that also very, very important. And then also the last point I can mention, because there are many points, but to, to save time, is the issue of the development process. I found it to be very clear and very informative, and it also takes one by the hand throughout the whole process. In one aspect that I think I found missing uh, in Dr. Bassoon's uh, presentation is the when he was talking about the different uh, uh, bodies, um, uh, political bodies and uh, continental and international bodies, I did not see, he mentioned BRICSA, uh, the United Nations. I thought I missed the African Union, uh, the engagement with the African Union. It will be interesting to hear where's the engagement with the African Union, uh, with the SABS. Then let me come to uh, Mr. Stables. Uh, there are two or three highlights I would like to uh, mention from his address. And let me also share with all the, 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 the listeners uh, uh, on this uh, uh, program right now that the reason why I did not prepare a written uh, uh, summary uh, or moderation is because I wanted to really uh, 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 listen to what the speakers they are going to elaborate on their points because I've seen what is written, yes, it was clear, but I wanted to also hear how they are going to elaborate uh, because they may share more info that is not in the, in the slides. So I found in uh, the presentation of uh, Mr. Stables that uh, we mentioned the issue of the meeting the requirements of learners and beneficiaries uh, is a very, very important point. And also I would like to complement it with what the Council of Higher Education is doing uh, as a regulatory body. Uh, the Council of uh, Higher Education is very clear that we really need to meet the, the requirements for learners and the beneficiaries, but primarily for the learners. And then, then there's another aspect which I found very interesting in the address by Mr. Stables is the issue of the interested parties. While you are speaking about the interested parties, there's something I think I found missing. Uh, he mentioned all the many parties and uh, the, 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 the government, labor market, the parents. However, I think I found uh, the issue of community engagement missing because uh, according to our government, the role of higher education as explained in the Higher Education Act of 1997 is very clear. It's got three pillars. It's teaching and learning, research 
and community engagement. So I found the issue of community engagement missing in his, as in his presentation. And then another aspect that I found missing in his uh, presentation is when he was mentioning, uh, talking about the management principles of uh, EOMS, is the issue of epistemic ideology. Uh, we, we, we have to be upfront. All teaching has got epistemic ideology from where it starts. So I found that missing in his address. And then uh, that covers uh, Mr. Stables. Then let me come to the last one, uh, Professor Ramphal. Um, yes, uh, Professor Ramphal spoke about the education, the benefits of sense and the educational institutions, the background he shared, uh, the issue of language. Then let me highlight some of the issues that are found missing in his address. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, Prof. Ramphal, I found you to come short of um, mainstreaming quality within the higher education institutions. Uh, that's number one. Uh, two, uh, the location of quality within the higher education institutions. Often uh, quality in many of the higher education institutions it's, it's not uh, located in one of the executive offices. Executive offices, I mean top executive of the university, like the vice principals. That also I found uh, that you were not very upfront uh, because uh, quality should not be an add-on in, in educational institution. It's the core business. It's, it's, it's part of the core business of what uh, higher education and educational institutions are about. Then another aspect that I found missing in your address, uh, Prof. Ramphal, is the orientation of university staff about the role of the SABS. Um, I think that is very important. Uh, the SABS uh, is doing amazing work. Having listened to what uh, Dr. Bassoon shared, I think we this information needs to, uh, I will use the word, uh, uh, um, I think to borrow it from the political uh, spaces, it needs to be massified. It needs to be known by as many as possible, especially all uh, teachers and academics in the higher education uh, uh, field. Because those are experts, as uh, uh, Dr. Bassoon mentioned, the, the role of experts, and then the fact that he said uh, the SABS does uh, uh, um, the issue of, uh, of um, standards, but it's not the regulatory, it does not enforce, uh, then that's why it's so important that we now get also another angle to this uh, uh, issue, uh, engagement with the Council of Higher Education, because that's the body that does the enforcement in the higher education field, especially in the universities. Then the last point I would like to share uh, with, uh, uh, with all of us present uh, is the issue of the working group, um, uh, especially uh, uh, to get the feedback and engagement from as many higher education institutions as possible. We know the history of higher education uh, in the country whereby some of the universities are so-called historically disadvantaged institutions, it will be good to get as much feedback from as many of the different higher education institutions into the current uh, 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 um, uh, work that is taking place and the sense and the educational institutions input that Prof. Ramphal and Mr. Stables, uh, their presentations uh, were on. Uh, on that note, that's a short comment uh, and a short feedback. And I hope those uh, aspects that are highlighted are missing and uh, the colleagues will engage on them. Thank you very much. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very, very much, uh, Prof. Humphrey. And uh, I think a comprehensive feedback for us. And I would like to, uh, Dr. Bassoon to then, um, if he can do the first um, answer for us. Um, I think the members of the panels can now, uh, panel can now switch on their cameras and then we can uh, look at them for uh, discussion. OK, Dr. Bassoon on the, on the AU. Thank you, Elian. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's a very important question, uh, but maybe I didn't articulate the clarity based on the timelines that we had for the for the presentation. Certainly, the AU is a very important stakeholder um, uh, in this entire 
um, in support to the implementation of the African continental free trade area. So um, uh, the African Union, basically representatives of the African Union are the member states. And uh, so uh, from the perspective of South Africa, ideally it will be the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition who are one of the key stakeholders who are stakeholders of the African Union. Um, so we are the subcategory, meaning the technical infrastructure within the DTI that participates at the RSO level. Now, the reason I say RSO level and AFSEC is because RSO, which is the African Organization for for standardization is, um, has been established in 1977 by the African Union, for formerly it was the Organization for African Unity, I think, um, and now referred to as the African Union. So uh, the African Union plays a significant role in the activities of ARSO, which is the regional standards body. And one of the fundamental um, um, objectives of ARSO is to harmonize African Continental Standards, which is referred to as uh, ARS, rather African Regional um, Standards. So we do play a role, not necessarily a direct role, an indirect role through the Department of Trade and Industry to, to the uh, African Union. Um, and secondly, in our role with the um, with ARSO in developing of regional standards, we indirectly play a role um, uh, in the stakeholder engagement with the African Union as well. I just wanted to highlight also that the African Continental Free Trade Area, that entire agreement, um, signed and ratified that by the member states has an annexure and that annexure defines very clearly the role of ARSO and AFSEC in support of the implementation of the African continental area, uh, African continental free trade area. So we might not have a direct um, engagement with the African Union because there's a very diverse range of directorates as well, but we do play a very influential role in, uh, in ARSO and AFSEC which uh, support the, the um, harmonization of standards in the region. Uh, thank you, I, I trust it provides the clarity. Thank you very much, Sadvir. Um, I, I would like then to ask uh, David um, on the community engagement uh, when we look at the uh, SANS 21001 as well as the EOMS. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Aline. Uh, first of all, the whole point of the presentation was uh, looking at the standard itself. And remember, standards are generic which means that they have to be accepted by all nations. In fact, for any standard to be published by ISO, the minimum is 75% uh, thumbs up. Uh, so it's not any country specific. But the term society would cover that community engagement because what, what else is society? It's a society at large. But uh, like I said, there may have been things that were, or some things that were missing. However, it was, the focus is on what is the standard and what is ISO 21001. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, I, I would like then to, uh, to go to uh, Prof Roy and uh, just um, giving us a bit of background on the mainstream uh, the, uh, and the location of quality and um, what you're going to do as INISA. Uh, to actually set an example, what is your plan forward to learn more about the SABS, the processes, and uh, know that we are also there to, to help you with that? Thank you, Ali. I think that uh, quality cannot run from an office. I think quality has to run with the people on the ground. And I think that we are busy doing that at UNISA that we have all our quality assurance practitioners empowering people to, to run quality as best as they could and to, to actually own quality. So quality does not run from a quality assurance office and from a quality manager's office. So we are busy trying to take that and I think Prof. Makosha has alluded to that in something that we, we are really, really doing. As far as the, the relationships go with, with SEPs, I can say confidently that UNISA has a MOU with uh, SABS and uh, that MOU is, is housed at the School of Business Leadership and we have worked together on, on a number of issues, a number of platforms 
or jointly, and we have created qualifications that talk to standards. We have actually produced uh, one doctorate candidate on standards. Uh, we've got two more uh, registered studying uh, the, the, the doctorates in standards. So, so we are very much at the SBL uh, located and uh, in terms of standards. We, we have a research focus area at the SBL in terms of business standards. And we're developing that in terms of also seeing if NRF can fund that later and, and fund a research chair for that. But I also take the point that uh, the Prof. Makoshwa is probably thinking is that this is not enough, you know. Uh, we need to go down to different universities. We have tried that. We have even tried to uh, have the academic forum uh, with SABS, which we are really trying to relaunch. Uh, we just waited for this event. So I think there's many, many, many opportunities for, for researchers. Uh, many, many years ago, the SABS was running like a cocoon in the sense that they didn't have many academics uh, working you know, outside the field rather than they were inside the field. And many of them worked as SABS uh, employers, uh, employees rather than academics. But now it's changed and we're working as one kind of partnership arrangement or we're working as partners, we collaborate, and, and we're doing many things uh, in terms of that. And we hope that uh, Prof. Makoshwa will also, in his uh, portfolio, expand this to other parts of UNISA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Roy. Um, and uh, I would like to, from the SABS side, um, acknowledge the fact that uh, we will invite more people to the working groups and the technical committees, and we take to heart that they are institutions that are not um, are always um, having the funds available to actually um, start um, to, to, uh, to 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 join uh, without um, being uh, getting a little bit of support, and maybe we can look at uh, look at the bigger academic institutions and say, uh, look after your brothers and sisters and bring with you uh, somebody from a, a, a academical institution to that can benefit uh, for you to mentor and bring into the technical committee and to be part of the working group um, um, that uh, develop standards in this uh, in the, the this field of quality especially for educational institutions I would just then ask um, to to uh, Prof Roy if you are ready with the video um, because I'm going to do the, the, the thanks and then we can maybe look at the video. Yeah, I think we are running a little bit out of time. Man. So okay, let's sure. Continue the the, 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 yeah. it, okay. I, I, I would know, like to think. Any other question and question from the, from the listeners? Okay, I've, we've got from the listeners, we've got from uh, Mr. Clifton Singh, um, who is asking, uh, should an organization like UNISA or a GSBL decide to embark on the SANS ISO 21001 certification journey, what steps should be followed by the institution who will be in the uh, who will be the independent body to conduct audits and assess compliance? Um, Mr. Singh, this question um, I believe. Uh, can be answered uh, not only by our executive, but by anybody in the room. But I'm going to ask our executive to answer it, and we will give you a written reply as well. Um, Sadir, to you. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks, Alian. So, um, yeah, it's important to go through a step-by-step -step process. The first thing that you need to do is get access to the standard. Uh, the second one is to to really understand the principles of the standard. The third is to ensure that you have a resource team capacitated to um, to implement the standard and implementation of the standard, as quite uh, rightly pointed out by Prof. Rampal and and um, Mr. Dave Stables, that it is uh, it has to get a seniority uh, and lead top management and leadership commitment 
to, to embark on this. It is not an individual sitting in a corner as a quality office to drive this. Uh, it will fail the moment you start. So you need to make sure that there is a strategic priority to ensure that you want to utilize the standard, implement the standard for a particular vision that you want to uh, determine as an objective for your organization. So acquiring the standard um, uh, top management leadership, which are one of the basically one of the principles, implementation of the standard, self-declaration of the standard, or prior to self-declaration, you want to do and mature the system. You want to embed that system into the organization. Uh, you can self-declare, and if you want to go the certification route, so uh, there are a number of certification bodies that uh, will obviously start going into the space of providing certification activities. Um, to the standard, including the SABS. So the SABS is an accredited, um, SANAS accredited um, certification body. And uh, my understanding is that uh, the uh, the certification body is looking towards being accredited to towards 21,001. And uh, um, SABS could be one of many certification bodies as accredited by SANAS to provide the independent certification activities uh, and to come in to do the audits and make sure that you comply and maintain compliance uh, for uh, the longevity of that standard. So I trust um, that answers um, the question there. Other questions as well, Helian, um, which uh, maybe, well, maybe you can give the uh, other colleagues an opportunity to answer or, or comment further on this particular question, uh, but there are other questions that I see as well. Thanks. So, yes, um, I would like to just go through some of the other questions. Yes, we will share the slides. We, If you also, um, for this specific question, if you share your email address for, with us, uh, if it's not the one that you registered with, then you can and, and you ask a specific question uh, regarding certification um, or more information. You, we are we will be able to come back to you. to the public. Yes, they are They're either on the SABS website, uh, which you can uh, www.sabs at um, um, and then you click on the web store and you are uh, able to buy an e-copy of that standard and it's basically instantly that you can. There's also a walk-in service that you can walk into the SABS to actually purchase this the standard. Um, further to that, uh, so, um, so uh, um, um, from Masita said the entity ISO 9001 certified can the standard be integrated with other standards such as quality and health? Uh, yes, um, there is integrated um, uh, um, certification that you can do and in integrated um, uh, assessments that can be done. Uh, we can put you in contact with our certification um, as well. Uh, we will do that. How do we get copies of the, um, the teaching standard guidelines mentioned by, um, I believe it was David uh, mentioned it. Um, uh, I don't know if you would like to just come in on that, David. Yeah, um, exactly what was the question about a teaching guideline? Because um, I don't, yeah. I don't remember exactly the okay. Uh, point. Okay. Um, I think if I can come in there. Really. Yeah. Okay, sure. Think, you, Prof. Prof. Roy. I think uh, Dr. Sadri alluded to teaching standards you know, how to teach standards. It's an ISO magazine that can be downloaded for free from the ISO uh, Focus uh, website. Oh, yes. OK, that, and that is all about the standards development and uh, th the that, that is correct. Standards. Uh, the teaching of standards. OK, so, um, so from the ISO website, um, but we will also give you a, a, a email reply on this. Uh, um, would you, uh, who would be the accredited body certified the education of standards? Um, as uh, Satvirus alluded, it can be uh, one of many, um, but when you do go out there, 
and uh, choose choose a institution to do your accreditation. Uh, make sure that it is a SANAS accredited institution um, um, because otherwise at the end of the day you might be accredited by uh, or um, certified by a body that is not uh, does not have accreditation and, and you, uh, you might find that uh, your certificate is lacking uh, when uh, two companies are um, compared, uh, the service providers uh, uh, will always choose um, to, to, to use a accredited body. The standards currently available for sale, I think that one we've cons uh, answered already. Um, uh, and we have a, very, a couple of uh, people acknowledging the uh, w great work that our presenters has done. Um, can you invite of the recording? Uh, yes, it will be made available right after the meeting. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the, uh, for the alignment uh, presentation. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, she, what is the question here is, are there any engagement with Uma, Uma Lucy? Uh, so if Prof can answer that. Yes, uh, basically uh, we are, we have already engaged with the, with the CHE in our exploratory work. We are going to engage with Uma Lucy, it's just that we trying to secure a meeting with them. Uh, so yes, that is definitely on the cards. Okay, Lerati from Misa. She says, does SAB's representative sit at the at PACI meetings or, or uh, it happens through ARSO and F FSEC? I think uh, that is already uh, been, it, it happens through um, ARSO and FSEC, but um, they, uh, very often uh, if uh, South Africa is the mo most knowledgeable person in the, er in, the, in the African region, then it will be a South African representative that actually represents our show or AFSEC in, in, in that uh, meeting at PAKI. So yes, we've certainly been there, and, uh, but it will be for, uh, via the, the, the um, two uh, regional, regional bodies. Thank you, Fran, for putting the link already on for us. And then we, um, I think uh, the last uh, question then, does SAB's representative sit at, oh, you've actually re-asked that question uh, for AU purposes. Um, I believe it is so, uh, it too, yes. It will be for African regional um, uh, uh, um, purposes. Sadvir, yes. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, so maybe I just uh, want, want to comment on this. I think it's a very important point, uh, colleague from Namisa. Uh, so just PACI, what does PACI mean? PACI is the Pan-African Quality Infrastructure. It comprises of the four regional technical infrastructure, or rather five institutions, are so AFSEC, uh, the equivalent from a regional perspective in terms of metrology, and that is AFRIMETS, and the equivalent of the accreditation bodies in the region, which is AFREC. So all these are the four regional bodies uh, that participate and have formed an institution as PACI. So uh, SABS has the opportunity, if we have a leadership position in, in uh, uh, through ARSO, to rep be represented at PACI. And uh, so the opportunity is, uh, resides, so too with NAMISA and SANAS as well. I am very well aware that NAMISA and SANAS plays an active leadership role um, at, at PACI as well. But uh, as much as we might not have an official seat at PACI, we play a very influential role in AFSEC and ARSO, and, um, and our uh, influences uh, are taken through to the, to the PACI table for discussion. That's uh, the clarity I want to provide. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sadvir. Um, and I also then would like to start to say thank you to all of our uh, um, presenters on the, of, of today. Uh, I would like to say thank you to David, uh, not only for uh, speaking today, but also for leading the group uh, that published the SANS uh, 21001 uh, uh, 21 or 21001. Um, and, uh, David has been with the committee uh, for a long time. He is inspired. He's g given us great knowledge, and 
today again you know, you realize that he he knows a lot about the standard and he can actually uh, teach us any one of us a lot in the room um i would like to uh, to 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 thank Pro prof roy uh, for his insight especially from my education and for those people that do postgraduate and what the institutions are going to do uh, to go move forward and then um, thank you very much for Prof Humphrey for giving us uh, the summary um, to actually bring the questions to the table uh, to, to start the conversation flowing. Thank you, Prof Humphrey. And then to my executive, uh, Sadvir, that made himself available today to lead us and to tell everybody about the great work that SABS is continuing in uh, from day to day and for the last 75 years uh, thank you Sadvir, for making a time for us in your diary as well and uh, i then uh, declare this event um closed and uh if uh, prof roy wants to play his video um, i give him opportunity to do that okay i'll just try it once more thank you Is it on the screen? It's on the screen. I, I just can't find the, the sound button. Uh, where was the sound button again? It's when just before you go in. I think what we can do, Prof Roy, is can we can actually video. send we can send the video uh, with together with the presentation. Uh, we oh. can add the video to them and then to for everybody at one of the attendees. Thank you for joining and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Elian. Thank you, Elian.